Michael Figured Conversations. Hi, Michael Figured here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we have our fifth guest on already and a lot more is coming. I did notice though that 96% of the people that are watching this video or listening to this conversation are not subscribed yet. So if you could please hit that subscribe button below, that would be very helpful to me. If you also would like to leave a comment on who the next guest should be, that would be very much appreciated. And together we can beat the YouTube algorithm, so please hit the like button and then we can move on to the interview. Thank you so much. Hello my ho, how are you? Hi Michiel, um, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good, good to see you again. Yes, it's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that you, you didn't have that much time because you still had to go to a massage. Uh, mm -hmm. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you do or why you would need a massage at all? For the people that don't uh, know you, of course. Uh -huh. So I'm an athlete and I run the track and field. I do 400 meters and 400 meter hurdles. And uh, yesterday I had a competition. <laughs> My first competition uh, so today there's a, a physio that will come to treat me to to get the competition from yesterday because mm -hmm. it was harsh um, kind of out of my legs so I can be fresh again for the training on Monday tomorrow what, was it tra was it training indoors or where did you have a training yeah indoors now in the winter season it's uh, indoors ah I, sh I should have said because uh, yesterday I think it was snowing so uh... yes <laughs> We drove uh, to the competition, it was in the north of France and it was snowing all the time and I was there with my coach in the car and another athlete and we had to get out two times to push the car because it was stuck in the snow. <laughs> and and the, the competitions are still going on in this, in this period? Yeah, but on a really small scale, like for every competition we will have to do a PCR test, a COVID test mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we will have to bring a negative uh, test and it's really there's not a lot of people so and there's a lot of insecurities also there are few competitions planned here in belgium but we are not 100 percent percent sure that they will go through how, how many of these tests did you already have to take um i think this was my fifth <laughs> not sure <laughs> and it's and it's always with the the cotton swab through your nose or yeah. how does it work yeah. Uh, well, depending on where you go, like I usually go to a lab and they do one cotton swab in my two nostrils and in my mouth. Mm -hmm. But the, the last one just did one nostril, but like really slow, like till the end <laughs> of, the, oh my God. of the nose and then like <laughs> turn around five times very slowly. <laughs> yeah. I've heard of other people that had to take it. I think, you know, uh, Bowens, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. He also had to do it because, yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he got infected for some reason, um, but other, other than him, I, I don't know any other people. So, but I can imagine in your field yeah. that it's something you have to do on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the next month we'll have, a, if everything goes through, four competitions after each other, like every weekend. That will mean like every week I will have a cotton swab of mm -hmm. my nose. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a very fun thing uh, to, to look forward to. Yeah. And you is are all the competitions that you do are they all for the the cheetahs? Because uh, to be honest, I don't know a lot about at at athletics, so I kind of did my research beforehand, but I'm still kind of uh, clueless about everything it entails. So uh, no, so like this competition was just an open competition; everyone was able to compete. Um, but yeah, due to Corona, the next competitions in Belgium will probably be only for the elite athletes. Mm -hmm. So those are the athletes that have like um, some kind of sponsoring from the government and are and are working towards bigger championships. Mm -hmm. So there will probably be other cheetahs too. But it's not that they organize competitions specifically for the cheetahs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, so you're in the 4x400 four team, mm -hmm. but I also read that you can also do the individual 400 meters. Yeah. Um, but the 4x400 four meters, that's uh, five people, right? Or at uh, least there were five people four, that were mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, there's four people run, uh, 
girls or men running. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, under team, we're with uh, 12 girls now. <laughs> But yeah, okay. there's a lot, a lot happened. Um, but we started the team with five girls the mm -hmm. first year, 2018. And then the year after there were some injured. So we had to get new girls. Mm -hmm. So we were, with, I think, eight. And then there are other girls running fast too. And then in the end, we're with 12. <laughs> but, but each competition, but when we you go only to pick competitions, four. Yeah, no, when we go to competitions, uh, they usually take six girls mm -hmm. the four that will be running and two extras like if one gets injured or yeah. something happens and yeah. and how do they decide which people should actually do it at that point um that's sometimes complicated that sometimes involves some drama uh but usually <laughs> it's the Ooh. fastest girls yeah but usually it's the fastest girl but sometimes there are girls saying yeah no i was maybe the better choice but you give her favorite treatment, so sometimes it's kind of difficult. It should be the fastest. But you, you are one of the fastest. No, I when I did my research, I even saw that you beat uh, Olivia Borlase uh, time. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know a lot was... about athleticism, but I know the Borlase, so I was uh, surprised. Yeah. Um, I was one of the fastest. Uh, but then I got a lot of injuries too, and yes, I beat Olivia Boyle once, but that was also at the end of her career, she wasn't that good anymore, and she's also more of a sprinter, like 100 and 200 meters, mm -hmm. so yeah. But still, it's, yeah. Some, it's, <laughs> it's something nice you can say, right? You, yeah, that you beat it's her true, it's true. It's still my one and only national title also, that competition, so. But uh, like... Um, I took a look and you have two gold medals, I think, uh, three silver and one yeah. bronze. Is that right? Because when I was doing research... I, I don't keep track. <laughs> oh, you don't keep track. Well, I saw that you, no. yeah, that you even have a Wikipedia page. Did you know? Ah, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't yeah. create it yourself, did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who did, actually. I don't know. Yeah, no, normally I go, I go through a um, LinkedIn page, for example, or Facebook, mm -hmm. um, but you don't have a LinkedIn page. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there a specific reason for that or is it just not necessary? I never needed it, so no. For atlasism, it's not uh, necessary, I no. guess. No, I don't even know that much about LinkedIn. I don't really know why I would need it or what you can do with it so <laughs> yeah i guess it really depends on what kind of what kind of job you have or what kind of yeah. thing you want to do in your professional life uh, mm -hmm. i have one but i i think it's just uh something that everyone does in my field um but mm -hmm. uh so you got into atlasm in, in 2018 or before that because i read that your biggest motivation or your kind of you got into athleticism for real after you went on Erasmus. Like, yeah. Uh, but what's so special about Erasmus that convinced you <laughs> to go into athleticism? It's not really a specific major event or something. Uh, I was just doing athletics for a few years and it went well. And people said like, oh, you're good. But I didn't want to go further with it. Like I didn't really like competitions that much or... But then on Erasmus, I was just talking with friends and the more people that say, yeah, but if you have the potential, why don't you try? And just by talking more and more about it, I just thought like, maybe I should try mm -hmm. to see how far I would come. And then, yeah, just by talking to people, there's not like a big event or something that maybe changed my mind. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think from the moment I knew that, that you got into, because we know each other uh, personally as well, that uh, you were already kind of good from the start, right? You had this innate yeah. talent. Uh, I mean, it would have been a waste to let it, to just let it slip, right? Yeah, yeah it's true. But I, I never, like when I got into athletics, I was like 15 years old. And I really remember I registered and you could choose like if you would be like competitive mm -hmm. or not competitive and i really chose not competitive i won't do competition i didn't want to do competitions and it just started rolling with it doing more and more competitions and then you notice oh i'm good at this and then you do more and more competitions and you start to train more mm -hmm. and 
now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did it change you on, on a personal level as well? Like how you... Um, yeah. Probably, like, yeah. Um, I, I, ca I can't really come up with something specific, but it, it will probably, yeah, surely change me. Um, especially the last years. Like the last years I had like some injuries which were mentally and physically um, uh, tough sometimes. So mm -hmm. that will definitely leave a, a mark. And is it something they, they guide you through? Uh, with the cheetahs or do you have to fix it in your personal life? Um, kind of both. Like the, the, the team is something not all athletes have because athletics is from basic. It's like an individual sport. Like it's good to have a team around me. Mm -hmm. they, they help me. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's still an individual sport. So you're usually on yourself and it's just difficult sometimes, but I have, thanks to the, to the cheetahs, to the relay team, a um, mental coach. Mm -hmm. So if I would really struggle a lot, I could contact her and she would help me. Uh, what, what are some of the things that they do with you to, to make you mentally tougher? Well, uh, I've only been to one, <laughs> one um, session with the mental coach because... <laughs> I mean, a lot of other athletes need it a lot and go every week or every month, but I'm usually on my own and I feel like I can take care of my own. But one time I went there and we just had a conversation and she was able to, to get stuff out of me that I didn't even know were troubling me. And just by saying something and like looking at me and steering the conversation, mm -hmm. she could feel and tell what was troubling me or what would make me better. Th those are just uh, regular conversations, then. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, and to help you with the team, how do they do that? Are those also talking sessions or special activities that you have to do? Um, well, we plan on doing a lot of activities this year because it's we're working towards the Olympics. But because of COVID, it's not really mm -hmm. possible. Uh, we had uh, one uh, team building in October. Mm -hmm. And then we did lots of different activities and there was also some activity like, like physical activities was also activities with the mental coach. Then there she tests our teamwork with like some little games. Um, there's especially leading up to a competition to a major championship. There's a, there's usually a few um, times we meet up, but to, to talk more and mm -hmm. talk about the goal and the teamwork, um, a lot of talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, so you got into athleticism and when you were 15, I think. Yeah. But uh, as I, if I can remember correctly, you came to Belgium when you were 12 or 13, right? Uh, yeah, I think 11 or 12, yeah. And, bef yeah, yeah. and be before that you lived in, in France. How, how, how come you moved from France to Belgium? Um, so, uh, my parents, uh, I think it was majorly because my parents wanted to give us a, a good education and we live like in the south of France, really in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And schools were not that great there and they wanted to give, I think, us all the possibilities. So moving to, Bel uh, to Belgium back again to have a better education, I guess, for us and also to be closer to the family, to my grandparents who are aging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. w would you say that education in France was not as good as it, is, as it is in Belgium? What are the main differences? Yeah, I'm not going to say France in general, but there in the south where we lived, it was, yeah, very laid back and not uh, that high of uh, quality. <laughs> <laughs> it, w it was too easy for you or? Uh, kind of, it was like, um, I mean, you know, my, my twin brother and I, we were born a little bit too soon. Mm -hmm. So they, um, when we were in um, like five years, they kept us back a year in school because they thought we wouldn't be ready. So when we lived in France, we were um, in the class with younger kids, mm -hmm. but then the, the school was school was pretty easy there, so they let us jump 
back again a year higher. Yeah. And okay. even then, I don't really remember doing a lot of work <laughs> for school there. So, yeah. Did they also quit like in the middle of the afternoon? Like at, um, at 2 p.m.? Yeah, there, like, I remember we didn't have school on Wednesdays. Uh, and, but we had sometimes a half a day of school on, on Saturdays. But yeah, it was re really laid back and small town. You know. And then... Um, yeah, well, uh, actually, we did an exchange with the uh, southern of France as well. And we also noticed that in, in school, but at that point, we were already 17 years old or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, that it was very laid back and it seemed yeah. easier than it was in, in Belgium, mm -hmm. I guess. But I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't want to generalize stuff, but it did seem no. like, <laughs> like it's like that uh, mm -hmm. in France, just overall. Uh I also noticed that here in Belgium, even in, in the primary school, they're really tough on the kids. So it's a big difference in that way. Yeah, I think I've thought about it lately um, that they should allow kids to be kids for a little longer. Mm -hmm. Also because like biologically, you are, your brains are fully developed by the time you are 25. Mm -hmm. So why not like shift two years later to let them make more difficult decisions. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. at the age of 18, you have to decide what you, yeah. you have to make decisions that will influence the rest of your life. I and, was 17 even, it's crazy. <laughs> and, and yeah, and most people, I mean, sometimes they just pick something just because mm -hmm. they don't know anything at all. And otherwise they just, yeah, I mean, they go in a field and that they hadn't really thought through or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so um, you started off in Belgium at the age of 12 or 13, but you you already spoke Dutch, right, as I can recall. Yeah. Um, so were there any things that were difficult for you in the, uh, from the start when you joined Belgian classes or when you met Belgian people? Um, well, I spoke Dutch because I spoke Dutch at home, so I could speak Dutch with everyone, but... Um, I couldn't really write <laughs> in Dutch, uh, so that was kind of difficult, the first classes. Um, but it was really, the thing I you know, had to get used to most was like the, the school was really big. Mm -hmm. I think, um, like first of all, when I, I went, in, in France I went to a really small school and we were with like maybe 10 or maximum 15 students mm -hmm. in one school. And then I went in Belgium to the school where there were, I don't know how many students, but only in the first year, like when we were in the same class, yeah, yeah, yeah. there were already 1,000 students, 15 different classes. And there were so many big buildings and you had to go to there and there. And there were so many people and that was really overwhelming. Yeah, I think <laughs> in total at that point, or at least when we graduated at 18 from med school, uh, there were about 1,000 700 to 1,800 people in total, yeah. but I think for each year was about 300 or actually by the time you are 18 They are you have a class or all students in that year together are about 300 people. So yeah mm, Yeah, so like the, the, the big scale of the school was really overwhelming and also just the Everything here in Belgium is so close to each other and you just take the bike and you go there and everything is flat here, the landscape, so <laughs> I didn't like that. <laughs> you, you prefer the nature of southern of France then? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. <laughs> I would say the same. If only there was some kind of yeah. mix in between, like a lot of nature and things relatively close to each other, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that's, that's why you go on holiday, I guess, to go back yeah. to nature. What, what was your last holiday? Um, in September, I went to the Ardennes okay. with my boyfriend. Yeah. All, right, all right. And you, you also live in, in Ghent, or am I mistaken? Um, I'm officially still living with my parents in Ardennes, but mm. I'm usually staying in Ghent in my in apartment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, um, so... At the age of 18, I, you chose for archaeology, I think, or did you do, so, did you do something else before 
that. Did I do something else before that? Or? I mean, did you start off in archaeology? That's the that's ah, this, yeah, the, yeah, the. I started um, uh, okay. in archaeology in the first year. Yeah. Why did you pick archaeology? <laughs> um, well, when I was a kid, I was already really fascinated by archaeology and especially. Uh, old Egypt, Egyptology, the mummies, the pyramids. I really loved that as a kid. But then I grew up and I kind of forgot about that. Um, but then in the last year of the middle school, um, I really didn't know what to do, what to study. I had lots of different interests, but I didn't really know what to choose. And then I mm -hmm. did this test online that helped you decide which... Um, study would suit you best and then archaeology came out on top and I was like oh I can do archaeology <laughs> I didn't know that existed because no one told me and then I started thinking more and more about it and everything they told about the, the study of archaeology really I like I really liked it so yeah I, I also liked um, the multidisciplinarity about archaeology mm -hmm. like there's theory but there's also like um, the, you also have to go outside, and there's also like some physical work, and yeah. Is it um, so the theoretical part? Is it mostly history? Yeah, I mean that's what I. It's, it's history, but we um, usually archaeology is also about older stuff. Like you have history that's really um, the the past. That, that we have written down okay. like from the, mm -hmm. the Roman era and the, the medieval age, ages. And like the real archaeology is about the study of the human past. So it's also about the prehistory. We don't have written archives about those times. Mm -hmm. um, and even when it deals about like medieval times, archaeology um, studies those times in a completely different way than historians. Yeah. Like historians really study the, the written texts. And archaeology, like the material, material stuff we find. Hmm. I, so it kind of deals with the same stuff, but from a different perspective. Crazy. I, I don't know anybody who yeah. studies archaeology, but you are, um, yeah. are you graduated uh, already? Or because I can no, imagine I, athletics and archaeology combined, it's kind of a, yeah. a weird combo or a hard combo, I, I should say. Yeah, it kind of is, but... Um, I just have to finish my thesis and then I'm finished. All right. And do you have a plan for the for the future? Uh, not really. Everything depends on how I will do in athletics this summer. Like if I run some good times or if I go to the Olympics, I might hope for a professional to, to have a professional contract mm -hmm. with the government as a professional athlete. Uh, but that's really difficult to get. These, the standards are really high. Um, so I'm not really hoping on that. Um, so when I graduate, I will probably find a job. I don't know if it will be in archaeology because I really want to focus everything on athletics. Mm -hmm. So I will just find a job that I will do part-time or something that I can that is flexible and that I can combine with athletics. Okay, as, so it's... It... You don't expect it to be in the archaeology field, then? Not yet. I've, like First, I prioritize my athletics career. And then when I um, retire from the sports, I will focus on my archaeology career. At, at what age do people retire from athletics? Um, I think 30, 35 years max. Okay, so you... Like, especially for a woman, it's difficult, like... When you're in your 30s, you, you want to start a family mm. and it's difficult to have to, to be pregnant or have a family while working out. So, yeah. mm -hmm. do, do you think um, like it's, it's easier for men in, athlet, in athletics to grow or what would you say the main difference are, differences are? Uh, I wouldn't really say it's easier for men, but it is easier to combine with your with your family plans or something. Um, like, I don't know if you heard, but like Alison Felix, a big name in athletics, she got pregnant last year or two years ago. Mm -hmm. And she's like one of the biggest names in athletics. And even she, when she got pregnant, 
she got her uh, her contract with Nike mm -hmm. was um, stopped because she was pregnant. So there's yep. been a lot of upheaval around it because like women can be athletes and mothers too. Um, so it's getting better now, but in that facet, it's sometimes more difficult. Mm, or, I mean, when women ga gave give birth to a baby, are they? Are their bodies not ready to be in athletics anymore or in any sports for that matter afterwards? Or? Uh, well, of course, you, you won't be running a competition right after giving birth, but it's um, proven and it's true that when you are pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, not when you're eight months pregnant, but like when you're a few months pregnant, you will be better actually physically. Oh. It's been a, a custom like in the, I think, 70s in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. to make female athletes pregnant <laughs> What? Okay. a few months before big competitions. And it's like a natural doping. And it was actually practiced in the Soviet Union but then, and then aborted after the competition. I was going to say because you can't do, yeah. you can't do a competition when you're pregnant, I guess, that wouldn't be healthy for the yeah, baby. Like, but like really in the early stages of a yeah, pregnancy, yeah. you know, but it is actually true. It's like a natural doping. And what what happens then or what changes in the body when you're pregnant that would allow you to perform better, you know? Uh, that I don't know. I don't know. I don't study physiology or anatomy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume you, you never got pregnant before a competition just no. because you wanted to win? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe I, I don't know every single detail about you, but uh, I would assume I would assume no. Um, so, are there any other things you can do to improve your performance for a competition, like things you can eat or can't eat? What I was wondering. Um, so, I've heard about the nasal spray, for example. Uh, that's something you can't yeah. do. Ah, yeah. yeah. That's something yeah. you can't do. Uh, I read, or maybe I don't yeah, know. Well I don't know the specifics, but it's true that like the, the, the nose spray, we can't take it um, because, and I, like I said, I don't know the, the specifics, but it would like open up your mm -hmm. breathing, mm -hmm. uh, respiratory system, yep. which would allow you to intake more oxygen, yep. yeah. which is kind of, yeah, it, it's like a doping. Um, but like what, what we can do, but you mean legal. <laughs> no, yeah, but like for example, can you drink is it okay to drink coffee for before yeah, a Yeah, lots of athletes do that. I don't, th I don't know if it would help you, but for like the sprinting disciplines, like the explosive ones, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of athletes that drink Nalu or Red Bull, mm -hmm. or like some, we have, there's some caffeine gums. Chewing uh, gum. But that's more effective. Yeah, yeah, but like with caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, sprinters who take those, for example. But first of all, for I do 400 meters, so that's a little bit less explosive, so maybe less effective. But also, um, I don't feel any effect of caffeine, so I haven't really tried that because I don't really feel an energy surge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but there are no more wondrous miracle products that would help you right before a competition. You just have to work hard, hard for it. Yeah, 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 and and just be well rested and mm -hmm. yeah. sleep is probably, uh, I guess, is probably one of the most important things to make sure you get yeah. enough of. Uh, yeah. And diet-wise, are there things you don't eat because? Well, in that aspect, I'm really lucky um, because I have like a really high metabolism. Mm -hmm. I've always been skinny, and I can practically eat what I want and I don't really have to pay that much attention to it but I know my fellow athletes they pay attention to it um, but I, I just pay attention to eat healthy uh, eat varied a lot of different stuff and sometimes I still eat some chips that's like my <laughs> my weakness <laughs> um, but I don't really I mean I pay attention to just eat healthy but I still allow myself to, to eat some candy or some cake or stuff do, do they notice if you eat something you, you are not supposed to eat? No, because there is no stuff I'm not supposed to eat. Oh, okay. <laughs> in my uh, case. Uh. 
and like sometimes we do a, a DEXA scan, like this, this it's like a scan that takes your um, um, body, um, mm -hmm. um, how, how much your body, how much fluids or fat your body has, mm -hmm. and I do that like twice or three times a year to see how much muscle mass I have and how much fat. So. What what's your uh, muscle percentage? Do you know? Or fat uh, percentage well, is probably what I you usually, know. I usually have a body a fat percentage of around ten percent. Okay. Which is really low. Yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. for females, even sporting females. So you you have the, the six pack me, six pack look. <laughs> What? Can you see six pack when you're at ten percent? If you're a woman, I think for for men it's around eight when you start seeing it. Yeah. So it's it's lower. Even, I don't know at which percentage you start seeing it, but. Uh, and but you don't you don't need to specifically train for uh, for six pack, for example, or. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do a lot. We do quite some. Ab, I mean um, exercises, but uh, we do we train the whole body. Like mm -hmm. we, even we do some bench press and everything because the whole body body has to be uh, in balance. <laughs> oh, so you're in the gym a lot. And the, as well. the abs are like we, we do a lot of abs because not because we want to also because we want to have some <laughs> nice abs, but those yeah. are like really important. Yeah. Like when you run in every movement you do, just when you're sitting, you always use your your abs. Mm -hmm. core, core strength for uh, stabilizing your body yeah, yeah. and is it yeah. something you you have to train in the gym then so besides uh, the track we usually do it even in some random um, workout like even sometimes before running training we do just a little bit of core stability or exercises before almost every training mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, so um, when, when you're done with uh, the archaeology part and you, you've been to an athletics competition and now you're like ready to sit in the couch uh, and watch a movie or a series where, or what, what is it you do in your spare time? Um, uh, there's quite some things. Like, of course, there's like the household that you have to do the groceries, you have to clean or make food. Um, uh, without COVID, I like to see my friends. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to watch movies or series. I love to read, but I forbid myself to read now that I'm still studying because I get really lost in a book <laughs> and I get no schoolwork done. So when I will have my master's degree, I will probably start reading again. Mm -hmm. Um, I recently started gaming also. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what kind and of con what console do you have? I play some bit of piano. Mm -hmm. Well, what console do you have? Or do you play on the computer? Uh, well, on the PC, on the computer. Oh, okay. Well, what do you play? Uh, it all started with my boyfriend, who is a big geek, um, and he get, got me to play Skyrim, Elder Scrolls. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I recently uh, installed The Sims also. Oh no! Yeah. When I was a kid. <laughs> which, which Sims do you yeah. have? Is it three or four? Is there a five already? I don't think so. Uh, no, now it's a four. Yeah. I, never, I, I had all the Sims as a kid, and now I thought, oh, like maybe I could try the newest one, the four. So I yeah. love that too. So yeah. Do, yeah. do you also train them, or do you also give them the skills to become a professional athlete, or how how do you train um, them? Well, I only got it recently, but I do a bit of everything. Like I like to make them painters or like artists mm -hmm. also. Uh, but sometimes I make them an athlete, or sometimes even like I, I really like that uh, um, super spy. What like super spy. spy? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think <laughs> when you when you teach them to be artists, that re that's really the best way to get them rich, right? Because they can keep earning money even after. Uh, they got the pieces. Uh, the yeah, after they sold the pieces. Yeah, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I mean, I always use the cheat code to get money. <laughs> oh, okay. That that's how I. Pl so I also played The Sims when I was when I was a kid. Or actually, yeah. I think it's still on my computer now because it was free for uh, a while. And uh, mm -hmm. I always, uh, yeah, I always let them become writer, for example, because <laughs> they, then they earn royalties. And uh, you get, keep getting money, but 
I mean, yeah. you have to try playing without cheats as well, eh, Mario? Yeah, I think I, I, I will do that one time. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, I don't think for, for Skyrim there are any... You don't cheat on Skyrim, do you? I don't know, I don't. But there's probably cheat codes for every game, but I yeah. haven't done that in Skyrim. <laughs> and what, what's your preferred uh, weapon in the game? Uh, well, I only it's all it's still the first game that I'm doing, but I'm doing usually like dual wielding, like two oh, swords okay. or like okay. a mace and a sword. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I liked the the magic, but it's not powerful enough. So <laughs> exactly, that was exactly the problem I had. So I started off as yeah. a as a magician, or I, I it's been such a long yeah. time that I played it as a magician, I guess. Yeah, after a while, you have to beat enemies that are so strong. That's just yeah. not possible with magic. And if you invested all your time training for magic, you just suck at all the other weapons. Uh -huh. So at that point, I just wanted to start over because it was not, I mean, it was not possible yeah, to handle it anymore. the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what is it that you read then? Is it stories or? Uh, fantasy. Fantasy, fantasy, like Harry, Harry Potter, yeah. uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, I haven't read Lord of the Rings, but I will probably do it one day. Yeah, just I like like the, the fantasy, the uh, dragon stuff and magic stuff. Yeah, I think your brother has almost all of them. So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he has the Hobbits and all of the Harry Potter ones. <laughs> do Do you see your brother a lot? Um, not much anymore. I mean, he, he started living in Ghent too, mm -hmm. but I don't really see him often. He's working and yeah. But with my family, we're usually like this. Like we don't see or hear each other a lot. Like we always say like no news is good news. Like mm -hmm. we're close, but we don't have to see each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Because recently you became an aunt. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's that yeah. like? It's really cool. I mean, I've never been like this girl that really is fond of kids or like, oh, I want to be a mother later, blah, blah, blah. But seeing my sister get a first child is really something special. Yeah. yeah and she's so cute. So. Uh, what's, her, what's her name again? Is it Na Nala? Nila. So? Nila. Nila. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, so what, what have you done with her already? With Nila? Uh, not much yet. She's only six months old, also. Um, I, not that much, actually. I mean, I see her sometimes, but she's also living in, in Odenaide with my mm -hmm. sister. Just cuddling, playing, keeping her entertained. But she's still a bit too small to do stuff, so... And she probably sleeps a lot of the time as well, no? Yeah, no, not that much, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Last time I saw her, she didn't want to, to sleep. <laughs> no? Did you... Uh, no. What do you, what do, you do then? Does, does it make you want to have children of your own? Or are you like, okay, no, no. now that I've seen this kid... No. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure about that. that uh, I think they're cute, but it's also fun to give them back to their parents. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, recently there's also a couple in our group... Um, Mm -hmm. They also got a child, and I mean, it's really fun to see that every everybody everybody just likes the kid. But I think everybody is also mm -hmm. still a little bit relieved that they don't have any children uh, because it's nice to have them for a while because it's fun and you you only get to do the fun stuff. But once you have to wake up at two or three at night, I think uh, it's a little bit less. Exactly. A little once bit they less. start crying or they have like some big. Uh, yeah well that's something i uh, i got i got used to when i was a kid as well because um my grandmother uh she like uh, kept children as a job i don't know how to say it mm -hmm. she was a kind of a nanny i guess mm -hmm. so from time to time i also had to wipe <laughs> the baby's butts uh, yeah mm -hmm. very fond memories <laughs> i can assure you yeah uh, no, um, so um, you were a little bit hesitant to come to come on the podcast. Uh, what was the reason for that? Because your English is, is pretty good, right? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, 
I don't feel like I'm that special to be in. I mean, it's not an interview, but to 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 have like a podcast or something. Mm -hmm. so I was honored, of course. But <laughs> yeah, especially like after the last two years, I didn't do a lot uh, in the athletics world. So yeah. Was it was it mainly focused on on the archaeology on your studies then? No, not really. I really did a lot of training, but I got some injuries and I wasn't able to compete. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, the reason I wanted to have you on, on the podcast is because, I mean, you are in the cheetahs, so that's already something special. And you also study archaeology, which is also something special. And then the company, I mean, how many people, well, you probably know a lot of people that study archaeology because, I mean, you're right. In, well, there's not that much, actually. <laughs> how, how many people are in your class, you know? Uh, I don't know. We, I don't see any other students anymore because I don't have classes anymore. Um, but we started with, I think, 60. And I think we finished the master. I mean, when we were in the masters, we were really 15 or 20. Ooh, okay, that's a very small group. Yeah, yeah. And do they they do they all want to continue in the field or do they? Yeah, I think I mean there's a lot of students that started out in the first year that already stopped because they didn't see themselves continuing in archaeology or it wasn't what they expected it to be. Um, but the ones that finished their masters, I think they're all or almost all working in the archaeology. Yeah. They are already. They already started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, usually it's just a four-year course. So, <laughs> and I'm already in my eighth. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but that's because of uh, your other career path, right? Mm -hmm. And is it something that they have to travel for a lot, or is it? No. Um, that's what you would think. Like a lot of people think archaeology is like this exotic going to Egypt or Greece, <laughs> but like um, visit the tombs of the they, pharaohs. They, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's uh, recent, like since 2015, there's been like a new um, law uh, for like um, archaeology, which means there's more work here in Belgium. Mm -hmm. So actually, now there's a lot of work for archaeologists here in Belgium. And also they, they teach us at the university, like really the archaeology of Northwestern Europe to, to, to stay here and not to go away. Well, they, they want you to discover things here instead of elsewhere. Yeah. And yeah. did you already have to look for things or did you already investigate certain areas? I'm not sure how it works. but Yeah, uh, we have um, internships. Okay, and then... So, mm -hmm. Uh, we, I, I did three already, I think. Yeah, I have done three or four internships. Did you, did you so find anything special? A, yeah, um, but I, did, I did two excavations in Belgium, mm -hmm. but the, there wasn't much stuff <laughs> to find. Um, th that, that's also, I mean, I'm not going to get into details, but Belgium is like, the, the soil is quite bad for archaeology. To, for, for conserving um, oh, but you can ground. go into detail a little bit it's inter it's interesting um, and people should just well, skip the section if they yeah, don't if it's not interesting to them it's difficult to maybe um, translate it but like okay. soil in Belgium is pretty um, sour, uh, like it has a high uh, pH level okay okay yeah mm -hmm. um, which is bad for conserving organic stuff mm. like bones or like wooden a wooden material or clothes or all the stuff from those times is organic and our soil is bad for preserving those um, but I went to I did one internship one excavation in Italy mm -hmm. and that was really amazing it was um, it was a Roman gray field okay and we found so much stuff and it was beautiful and um, there were like these big roof tiles mm -hmm. made like the, the, the coffin, the box, but like Roman graves are usually um, cremations. Okay. So not full skeletons, but like an urn with cremation remains. Oh. And we found okay. lots of pottery. I found some coins, um, some um, glass, um, parfum, um, perfume um, holders. And uh, yeah, it was really nice. Th those are things that you find on your own then because you're working yeah. on a specific spot and then 
you're digging or dusting or I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know uh, the details of it, about archaeology. Mm. I just know like Indiana Jones, uh, but that's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I liked that too when I was a kid, but that's not our, that's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and, in, and in Belgium, so you can't find a lot of stuff because the ground is too sour or the, the pH level is too mm. too high. But mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you can find here then? Or those are from older times? Well, we can find the same things, but the, the chances of finding them are smaller. And usually we find like, um, the, like the remains, like uh, what we find the most is potholes. Um, it's like when they, when they, they, they built um, a building mm -hmm. in like 2000 or 5000 years ago, they dug a hole in the ground to put a, a wooden uh, column or mm, to make yeah. a house. Yeah, okay. Hello? Yeah, I think um, so. But the, the wooden pole mm -hmm. has disappeared mm -hmm. because of the soil, mm -hmm. because it's organic, and through time it just disappears. But we still see the trace of where it was. So that's a pothole. So we don't oh, okay, find okay. the material, yeah, yeah. but we find traces of where the material was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that's usually like, mm -hmm. what we find. Like the whole a hole where the house was mm -hmm. is like filled with, with, with everything and whatever. Uh, but yeah. over time, the the um, the wooden pole has just vanished because of the soil. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a hole, mm -hmm. and that's the pothole. Then, yeah. Well, we still see that there's a color change. Like you have the the soil, mm -hmm. which is like this kind of brown. Mm -hmm. But then you see this part. There is a circle that's darker or lighter. It has another color. Mm -hmm. So there there was something here. But it's not here anymore. But we still see traces of it. And how do you how do you know what what it was that was there? Um, usually, it's because of the theory behind it. Like when we find a whole row of potholes, we know like there are four in one row. We know okay, there are four columns here to make a wall or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we can see patterns. Like we see, oh, this pattern pattern is like this. This was a house or something like this and sometimes you still find traces of wood or yeah interesting uh, and yeah. what, what do you so you said you also found some some pots or some so, yeah some other materials what what do you do once you found them um we have to label them like we put them in a plastic bag and we label it so like later it can be studied and put in an inventory and everything that contains the information of the, the excavation. And that's something you do. You continue working on the things you found yourself, or is it just passed on to somebody else? Um, I think it depends, but usually you do it yourself. Oh, okay. And have you found something specific on some of the stuff that you found? Well, I haven't done it myself yet because oh. I just did the internship, like it was two weeks helping in the excavation. But I think that the workers there, they eventually they will have studied the material. Hmm. But I haven't done it myself yet. Uh, and are, are some of those pieces meant to be in a museum or what happens with them? Um, though I guess some of the stuff we found in Italy could be museum worthy but i have no idea where they ended up <laughs> ah too bad I, I think they should put the name of the person who found a specific thing yeah. also below that would be that would be nice but, right yeah so i think um what they so when they're studied i think it will be mentioned in like the report or the, the study mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. oh <laughs> That, that's so because cool. Because like when you when you're like at the excavation and you're working in your spot and like you find something, mm -hmm. you put like the label like I told you, and you also put like all the information like at the date, the excavation site, what kind of material it is, the name of the the, the one who excavated it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So and do you prefer like your archaeo archaeologic path or your athletic path? Uh, it's completely different. Y uh, yes, that, that's, <laughs> the, that's the least you could at say. At the moment, yeah, at, at the moment I'm more um, invested in, in, in my athletics career. Mm -hmm. So I'm 
like I, I do admit I don't really feel an archaeologist or a student because I'm so focused on my sports career so mm -hmm. like archaeology kind of disappears in the background but I guess like when I will be stopping with sports it will come back and I will like that more oh okay like now archaeology is like my backup plan and I'm prioritizing the sports yeah it makes sense are there people mm -hmm. like in your in your uh, in the Belgian cheetahs that don't have that backup plan or that are just full into sports and don't think about an uh, no, option B? I think everyone is or a student athlete or already graduated and a full-time athlete. Ah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And but um, So now the full team is uh, only women, but I, I read that it's also possible to have mixed teams yeah and is it then is it always two uh, two women and two men then in the team yes yeah so that's something that's uh, really um, new like since 2019 2019 at the world championships was the first time they did a mixed relay mm -hmm. um, and it's always two men and two women but you can choose in which uh, order they run mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is, is, but is, is, most teams mm -hmm. use the same order. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at this point, they probably scientifically know what's where, where to put each person, right? Like who performs I don't know if best it's at scientific, which part? But yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if it's scientific, but they just put like first they put a man, mm -hmm. then two women, and then to finish another man. I don't know how it came to be. Like the first times there were some more differences, but at the last championship, uh, I think all the teams but one used this order and the team that didn't use this order had a woman finishing off mm -hmm. the relay mm -hmm. and she was, it was a Polish team um, and they were running like really high up ahead, but then... I mean, the woman is like, was like one of the best in, in the world, but she was so overclassed by the men running faster and it was really suck <laughs> to be at that time I mean you're, you're giving it your all and then just because you're female you get just passed by all those men and, yeah. yeah but I mean I guess uh, on average if there's two men and two uh, women then it shouldn't really make a difference right because if they if no. each of uh, if all four of them just give it their all and mm -hmm. it's just the, the better team on average that would win. So Yeah, that's true. Uh-huh. But maybe But uh, still, yeah. I mean it, it, it I think it's frustrating when you're running against men, you're like the same level mm -hmm, mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. But just because you're female and there are men male, they just outclass you. Yeah, that's but that's just um I mean biological yeah. difference, right? Uh -huh. There's not there's nothing you mm -hmm. You can do about it. No, but it's not. It's it's not nice when you're. I mean, nice. It's not good when you're running a competition to be in pursuit. You always run better when you run in front. Like when you're in pursuit, you usually uh, get too pressured and too strict in your movements. It's it, mm. that's proven that it's it's always better when you run in front. And is it because? When you're in pursuit, you so like you said, there's some pressure, and you mm. kind of forget maybe technique a little bit or yeah, like efficiency. It's kind of like this: when you're in front, you don't see anyone, and you're focused on your own race and your own technique. But when you're following uh, like someone, you're like in second or last position. You're more focused on oh, I have to get him, and your running technique would get. Hmm. N would not get as good. I, I would have thought that running, that like having somebody run in front of you would actually help you to run faster. But yeah, that that also it, it's a bit conflicting. But yeah, I mean it does motivate you. Mm -hmm. But technically speaking, there is higher chances of running better when you're in front. Hmm. I, I still remember when, and I think I was. 13 or 14 and we had this uh, athletics days at school you probably remember mm -hmm. them as well uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I had to do I, I didn't know which distance to pick 
So I thought, mm -hmm. well, maybe, uh, what is it, like 60 or 80 meters sprint? Yeah, 60? that's for small, yeah, yeah, when, small kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to pick that because I can't sprint. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I thought, okay, I just need to pick a bigger distance, but not too big because I don't want to run for too long. And then I picked mm -hmm. 800 meters thinking that... Oh, interesting. <laughs> yes, interesting and very memorable, but not for the good reasons. Um, <laughs> so I thought, okay, 800 meters, if I just pick that, they will start off like, kind of like you would run regularly. And they shot a gun, it went off, and everybody just ran off. I was like, guys, we still have yeah. to run like for 750 <laughs> more meters. You're never going to make it, but then, yeah, I mean... I was like a half a lap behind or something. I don't know. <laughs> I still remember it's, uh, it was traumatizing. Yeah, 800 event. meter is like longer distance, but you still have to run fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at, mm. the, at that point, I never really trained for any of those days. So it was uh -huh. very painful. Yeah, I, I remember at that same athletics day at school in the first year, I for the same reason, because I'm not a sprinter, I chose a 300 meter which is a better option than 800. <laughs> was 300 an option as well? Yeah, I did it in the first year. Oh. Um, and I broke the school record. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder if you're still, do you remember in the, the school gym? No, the... I, was, I, I, know, I wasn't doing any athletics or training at that time, but just like my talent, let's say. Um, but I do know that a girl like one or two or even three years after me broke the record because she told me because she did athletics she was oh, oh yeah i broke your school record so <sighs> damn yeah. did, did you have any other records on your name no i almost had the school record this following year and um high jumping <laughs> oh okay but I, I didn't get it, but I almost had it. That was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so you did 300 yeah. meters, then uh, high jumping, and then, wait, th a throw? Uh, there's some throw exercise you have to do yeah, as well? Yeah, hockey ball throwing. Hockey ball throwing. Uh... In the first year, it was hockey ball. Hockey ball? And oh, then okay. the second, yeah. 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 And then afterwards, uh, with the, the big iron ball, you have to throw. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what yeah. what the name is in English, but uh, yeah. um, oh my god, um, <laughs> shot put. What? Shot. Shot put. Oh, okay. And what's the one with the sphere? You know the uh, javelin. A javelin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, javelin. I always did that one because I mean, it 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 looks so beautiful. That's really difficult. Uh, yeah, it's a very yeah. Technique. It, it looks beautiful, but it's really difficult because it's very technical. Yeah, I mean, I saw people that that. Because at that point, I think uh, I also started doing some some gym, uh, mm -hmm. and I thought I was I was getting a little bit stronger. So I thought, okay, I'm going to throw a lot further. And then there were people that were not as strong as me that just throw so yeah. much further. I was yeah. like, God damn it! How did they do it? Yeah, I did some um, um, heptathlon when I was younger in the track and field, and I really liked it because the, the atmosphere is really nice, and you do like seven disciplines on two days. Um, but the javelin was really my worst discipline. I mean, you would think because I'm pretty skinny and not that muscled that um, shot put, which is pretty heavy, would be my mm -hmm. worst discipline. But no, it's it's javelin. It's really difficult. There's like some technique, mm -hmm. and I just don't get it. What are the seven the seven sports you have to do? Um, so uh, it's the one where Nafi Tiam, of course, uh, mm -hmm. excels in, um, and you start with a uh, hundred meter hurdles high jumping, shot put, and 200 meters for mm -hmm. the first day. And then the second day, it's a long jump, javelin, and 800 meters. And then, and then after that, you just rest for two weeks, I guess. Yeah, then for the men, it's worse because there's a decathlon, there's 10 disciplines. And there's the, yeah. the, the disciplines are pretty heavy because there's even um, pole jumping, pole vault jumping. Which oh. is really hard to, yeah. That's something I want to try someday, <laughs> but uh, it's very difficult, also. <laughs> and so I think it's also very dangerous. It uh, oh, not really. I don't think it's that dangerous. Can can stick snap? 
Yeah, that happens <laughs> quite often, actually. <laughs> oh, okay, that's something that would happen. And I think I it's 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 maybe it's shocking for in the first moment, but I don't think there has been like some heavy accidents. Nope. Well, I think the material also always gets better, so. Uh, yeah. Ch yeah. Chances are very slim of accidents happening, unless you're kind of a mm -hmm. stupid person, maybe that just doesn't. Uh, <laughs> adhere to the rules that they have when doing yeah. it. But <laughs> how high are you off the ground at that point? It's like... Uh, well, the, the men, the, 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 like the world-class men are jumping over six meters now. That's like over a house. Yeah, and the, the woman is like the top of the world is like five meters. Almost over a house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. No, that's so cool. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, um, Marhu, so what I ask all my guests, and again, I forgot to mention this beforehand, but, but uh, I always ask them, what is a question you would like to ask yourself? And then you can answer it to yourself. Or if you don't know any question, you can also uh, ask me a question. But you can pick. That, that's, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, that's what I everyone know. tells me. I still need to find some kind of very... Uh, I, I need to find something that, that will differentiate this podcast from other podcasts that you might have. So I'm trying to find something that I can do. Uh, with this. Oh, don't worry. I don't have other podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> but if this were to happen in real life... so um, And in the meantime, you can think of a question. I'm kind of blabbering on so you can think a little bit. Um, I have uh, this homemade limoncello and I would give my guests some limoncello and then they can try it out and ah, tell me what nice. they think. Yeah, yeah. And actually mm -hmm. yesterday uh, I made limoncello but also with lemons and I also made mm -hmm. one with um, uh, the green ones. Uh, uh, ah, um, um, lime. La yeah, lime and then also uh, clementine. Oh, nice. But I don't know what the other, like limoncello, everybody knows what limoncello tastes like, but the other two are kind, kind of still a mystery. So uh, mm -hmm. I hope they will be drinkable. And because it's not uh, store-bought, it's a little bit of an experiment to try it out <laughs> yourself without mm -hmm. uh, medical supervision. But uh, So if you don't hear from me in like two weeks, uh, <laughs> please call an ambulance or something or... Uh, yeah. <laughs> check, check me out. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh. I'll take notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, you're drinking from um, is it uh, is it ethics? Yeah, yeah. But it's just water. But it's a ethics uh, bottle. Do Do you have that's a sponsorship for your athletics career, right? Yeah. Do you have other yeah. sponsorships as well? I have Adidas, which I'm also wearing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is there are yeah. there special things you have to do for them when you, when they offer you a sponsorship? Um, not really. I mean, like for ethics, they ask to um, put some stuff on social media. Uh, I do especially uh, Instagram, but there's like they're not too specific. Uh, but like maybe other sponsors would be quite specific, but it's okay. And Adidas, I don't really have a contract. So I'm not bound to any requirements, but like for the, I think for the, the clothing brands, it's especially just the, the best um, ads they can get is just me going on competitions and running well in their kit. Oh, okay. So that, they just want yeah. you to win. That, that's all you have to yeah. do really. Just, just yeah, win. I mean, I mean, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and ethics, uh, do you, do you need to do posts on social media for them or what do you need yeah, to do? Yeah, I, I, they, they want us to do that and I also do that, but there's not like a specific amount of posts or stories I have to put online. Right, they don't have special rules for it? No, no. I, and I think, I, I, think, I think they would tell me if they wouldn't be happy. <laughs> yeah, you, because you, you tend to have... I mean, if you see a lot of other different sponsored posts, they are very, how do you say, they look like advertisements, but your posts just look like you're just posting stuff in your mm -hmm. regular life or like, yeah. So that's yeah, what I, I like. I just try to, to remain like like myself. I don't want to be too, too overly um, 
generalized or like doing something because people expect me to do mm -hmm. that. I just try to be myself on social media. Yep. Do, do they, so for Adidas it's clothing and for ethics it's um, supplements. Supplements, yes. Um, do they, <laughs> that's an indiscreet question, I, I guess, but do they also uh, sponsor you with money then? or? No. No, um, I tried that. Uh, like when they contacted me to sponsor me, I they they um, uh, proposed like uh, some um, supplements. And they also asked like, yeah, would you also be interested in sponsoring with some money? But they they didn't want to do that. But I'm happy with just the products that I get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that's one uh, one thing less that you have to mm -hmm. buy for yourself. <laughs> Yeah, because they're pretty, ex I mean, supplements and like recovery shakes and protein shakes or stuff. I use, the, I use them a lot and they're pretty expensive. So that saves me a ton of money. Is it mostly the, re the recovery shakes then or like more protein yeah. shakes that you... Also, like I do two uh, power workouts in a week. So then I take a protein <laughs> shake and after some heavy running workouts, I do the recovery shakes. Hmm. Right. And is it something you can't get with regular meals or? Uh, yeah, you get because like ethics, apart from like the, the recovery shakes, they also have like uh, the supplements like uh, vitamins or iron mm -hmm. or uh, magnesium. Um, those are things you usually get from your um, from your meal. Mm -hmm. But as an athlete, we have we do so much training. We have so much physical yep. um, and work that just our food is not enough yeah, yeah so yeah. but like normal people have should have enough with just uh, their food mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. well uh that's something <laughs> when i just started out at the gym uh i also like took these protein shakes and so mm -hmm. on but because it's not a professional it's not a professional thing to do um or i don't do it professionally it didn't make a lot of sense. And also they can get quite expensive, right? It's yeah, like, uh, yeah. I mean, if you have to buy one every two weeks or, the, or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, <laughs> you're just yeah. financially broke by, by the end of, uh, of the year. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but usually we take them, uh, I mean, a lot of people in the gym, I guess, take like protein shakes to mm. try to get more mass muscles mm. or faster. Mm. But like we, we do it just for uh, the optimal recovery. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Like we had a hard workout and your body needs protein to get recovered again yeah. and well rested for the next training. To um, to kind of recover the torn uh, muscle fibers. Yeah, exactly. Because every time you work out, in fact, like you said, you break down your muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So you have to build it up again with shakes mm -hmm. and with food and rest and sleep. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, Marhu, do you have a mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have a question? Uh, not yet. <laughs> um, do you have one? <laughs> I, I I had many questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, I mean like my second guest. He told me to always tell them before to always tell tell my guests beforehand that I'm going to ask this question because then they can think about it. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was going to say that too. Like, yeah. you, you don't have to send the, 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 your questions like beforehand, no, just no. that one, because it's something that needs time to, yeah. Yeah, 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 I, I can imagine. Actually, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty dark uh, in your room already. Oh, sorry. No, but it's, uh, but it's kind of changes all the time. Is it because you're sitting yeah, near yeah, a, just... a window or or? I'm in fact I'm in front of the window, uh -huh, uh -huh. but nope. um, is it too dark? No, 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 no. It's fine. Uh, do you do you have any special? So right now, because of the whole situation and the, you know uh, the COVID thing and so on, um, I'm, I guess a lot of things you want to do are restricted. Uh, so mm -hmm. do you have any special plans for once this whole thing is done? Uh, not specific plans, but I would just like to meet up with my friends again, play some board games with my friends again, just regular life, do competitions, 
without a cotton swab up my nose. Um, yeah. Being able to train with everyone because now I don't see my whole training group because they're not all allowed to train in the indoor facilities. Mm -hmm. um, just going on a um, training camp again because it's been quite some time. Um, just doing some just life as usual. I, I would travel like to travel, but because of my athletic, athletic career, I don't travel that much either. So, well, yeah. Where do you want to go to, or what what country would you go to right now if if all was open again? Right now, <laughs> uh, I would really like to see, like maybe Latin America, like maybe Peru or something, or maybe Cambodia, <laughs> yeah. or maybe or, or maybe all of them in one trip, one one yeah, big trip them, like, to do all of them. Uh huh. Yeah. Or Scandinavia also, yeah, uh, Egypt, a lot of stuff. <laughs> have you been to any of these Scandinavian? countries before no, um, well I've been to Denmark for a city trip once to Copenhagen I've been to Finland once but mm. it was just for a competition so okay. I didn't see in Denmark have you been to the Legoland no no, no but ah. I've been to the National Museum okay. and it was really worth it there's some beautiful archaeological <laughs> stuff is that is that your first thing to do once you visit uh, another country to go to an archaeological uh, museum uh, I usually don't do that, but it, but it was winter and it was really cold, so we just wanted to go inside. <laughs> do you know uh, what would be interesting to go to? I mean, if you're interested in uh, in Russia and so on, uh, have you ever been to Saint Petersburg? No. So no. in Saint Petersburg, there's a, the Hermitage, mm -hmm. and I think that's the the third largest museum in the world. It has it's a three story uh, mm -hmm. museum, and I, I went there on my own. So I, um, I started off in the morning nice. and when I was done, I exited the museum and then I noticed just before I exited that there was a third floor. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but the Hermitage is definitely worth visiting, definitely. Okay. And if you really want to have the, the nicest experience ever, I feel like you should go in winter as well. Yeah, because probably. It's, it's a very it's a very beautiful place it's, it's there's mm -hmm. a very weird atmosphere because I mean mm -hmm. like your ideas about Russia um, kind of I don't know especially if you go in the winter it's kind of gray and uh, mm -hmm. a little bit colorless except for all the buildings that they have they have all these special um, yeah what's it called I don't know the name but they they have gold plates or they are in green and gold and and red and then you have the white snow mm -hmm. below that that's that's just mm -hmm. awesome so if you have yeah, the time but there are some countries or some places that are probably best seen in winter like russia probably <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> actually um well, when i visited uh, st petersburg i thought it was going to be like extremely cold so i bought mm -hmm. these um these special fleece kind of things to put over your mm -hmm. body first like special underwear, thermic, thermic underwear, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I got there, it was only minus two. So it oh, wasn't really... That's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I was sweating when I got off the plane. Uh, yeah. No. Oh, you have a very nice place, uh, Margot. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you decorate it yourself? Uh, yeah, with my uh, flatmate. Ah, you're not you're not living with your boyfriend. No, 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 no. We're both still studying, so. <laughs> would it, would it be too much of a distraction? Uh, no, not really. But we just don't have the funds. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. I get it. Yeah. And uh, the friend is from um, from school or something or. Uh, via via. It was like the daughter of friends from my parents who was looking for something in the same area at the same time. Hmm. Uh, hmm. All right. Great. Uh, well, Margot, uh, if, do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. Um, I'm also a very indecisive person. So <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't really have one. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. I asked most of the questions that I that I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. 
and uh, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, the archaeological part and the athletic part and the way you combine both of them. Uh, and I'm really glad you wanted to join this podcast also because it's like uh, a whole hour uh, in English. So that's, <laughs> I mean, I, you would think that not a lot of people will want to join it, but actually there, there never was a person before that declined because of it being in English. So I guess... No, that's not a problem at all. <laughs> I guess Flemish people are uh, used to talking English mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, but I still I still have a friend from Portugal who I have contact with and we sometimes call. So I also speak English with her and that's no problem at all. <laughs> and it's good practice for your international interviews as well. If you have voilà. to do them. Voilà. <laughs> if you have to do them, yeah. <laughs> I will thank you later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just send me a thank you note once uh, the situation mm -hmm. arises. <laughs> I will assign a photograph for you and send it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Yeah, yeah, definitely with a, a signature on. And then I can tell everybody that I got a, a signature from a famous person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Margot. And I hope someday uh, I can invite you again and then you can try out the limoncello in person. Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> and hopefully it's out of your system by the time you have to compete again. <laughs> Uh, Maybe in off season, like in September. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'll write it down. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Marco. Thank and, you for uh, the invitation. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I, I knew you were a good person to invite to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. Bye, Marco. Yeah. Bye. bye.